Well, hey, uh, my name is Aaron Brown, lead pastor here. And um, I, I want to let you know, we are in episode two of the series we just started last week, Parenting in the 21st Century. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things I kind of worry a little bit about because you might be thinking, well, I'm not a parent or I'm a grandparent. Or I'm not a parent yet or don't want to be a parent or whatever it might be. But we all play some role in the raising up of the next generation. All of us have some part to play. And maybe that's as a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or a foster parent or a teacher or a mentor. Hopefully we all step into some role of making sure that a child, an infant, uh, a, a preschooler, a middle schooler, a high schooler, a student of some sort is prepared for life. Because we all realize at some point, I think, or at least I did, that um, simply because I had a parent doesn't mean that I'm ready to be one. <clears throat> simply because I was a kid doesn't mean I know how to raise one, right? That we all need help in doing this thing called life. So before we really dive in, I want to encourage you to do two things. One is to jot down some notes, get your phone out, grab a piece of paper, pen, jot a few things down that you want to remember uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it helps to remember and engage when we're writing things down. And it reminds us that we're not just consumers, that I'm um, writing this down because, I don't know, there might be a place where God wants me to share this with someone else. I am an ambassador. I am a messenger. That's what I hope that we all claim when we come to worship on Sundays. So here's where we are. In this uh, last week, we started the series by talking about the difference between the ideal and the real in life. That there is an ideal that we want to aspire to. And one of the temptations in life, uh, and especially in our 21st century American culture, is to say, no, we want to do away with the ideal because it just is too painful when we don't hit that ideal. But the ideal is so important for us to have something to grow toward, to lean toward, to, to uh, decide toward. And we talked about how Jesus not only did he give us an ideal, but he also lived with us and lives with us in the real, that he was a master of being in between those two places. We talked about uh, last week how uh, he was very critical of the religious leaders because they didn't do that. Uh, it, what's interesting about Jesus, one of the many things, is that people who couldn't meet the ideal flocked to him. He, they, they loved him, and he loved them, but, it, you know, he, he never dumbed down the truth in order to make people feel better, but he also never turned down the grace when people failed to hit the ideal. He, he did both of those things beautifully. In fact, the only group that Jesus really didn't seem to like uh, were, were the religious leaders who held out an ideal to people but never helped them in the real world situations to get to that ideal. In fact, Jesus gives them, those people who held the ideal up so high and never helped anybody to meet the ideal in the real world, he said, woe to you. And I'm going to tell you this, you don't ever want to be on the receiving end of one of Jesus's woe to you, okay? Uh, take a look at this. This is, uh, this is John, or excuse me, Luke 11. Jesus says, woe to you, the religious leaders, because you load people down with burdens that they cannot bear, they can't carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. So remember, we're living in that, that place where we live in the tension. We're not trying to resolve this tension between the ideal and the real. We live within it knowing that God is there with us. Jesus is there uh, helping us. Now, if we're talking about parenting, one thing I mentioned last week too is we open up scripture, we look for good examples of parents and families, and they simply aren't in there. What, what our Bibles are full of is pictures of dysfunctional families. You know, actually, the, the kind of examples that we have there are bad examples. We can say, okay, we don't want to do that. And we even recognize that, that Jesus had a little bit of issue with his own, within his own family, with his siblings. There was a point at which his siblings came to him because he was, he was so busy. He was helping people, healing people. He hadn't even had time to eat, and they thought he was crazy. Not just in that one instance, but they really struggled with who Jesus was until the resurrection. It's interesting how a resurrection changes people's minds. It really is. And, you know, so they thought he was crazy. And then like, oh, the resurrection happens. Um, that answers a lot of questions, Jesus. Thank you for that. Um, but what we, what we see in, in Jesus is that he laid a foundation for his followers to, to have a behavior. And he called this new behavior a new covenant command. 
a new covenant command. So, so Jesus didn't tell us how to be good parents or grandparents or foster parents or anything else, but he said, here's a new command from which you will learn many things. <clears throat> here's that new command. He even calls it that. This is John 13. He says, a new command I give you, and it's simple, love one another. Now, that doesn't sound like a new command, does it? It was new to them in many ways. To us, it's not so new, but he fleshed it out and said, here's what love looks like. As I have loved you, this is what it's supposed to look like, you must also love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And so this new command, when we see this fleshed out, what we're seeing is Jesus is replacing all the other old commands with this new command. And, and Paul calls this new command the law of Christ. The law of Christ. When you're reading the writings of Paul, you hear this all the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Love one another as Jesus has loved you. I love the, Andy, I love the way Andy Stanley puts this. He says, following Jesus will make your life better and will make you better at life. Following Jesus will make your life better and make you better at life. Following Jesus will make you a better parent. Why? How would following Jesus, if you're not a believer yet, you know, or kind of gave that up or whatever, you know, how is following Jesus going to make you a better parent? Well, because the brand of Jesus sort of love takes us out of ourselves. The, the Jesus kind of love is a love that is, is no longer self-centered. It is other-centered. And let's face it, nothing reveals our self-centeredness and our selfishness quicker and fiercer than raising a human being. Tell me if I'm wrong. A human being that comes into this world with one agenda, and it's the agenda that you came into the world with, that everybody comes into the agenda with, the, the world with, and that one agenda is me, <laughs> what I want, what I need. It's I want it my way, and if I can't get it my way from you, I will get in your way and make your life miserable along the way. Now think about it. From day one, the stage is set for this epic battle of the wills, this is epic proportional clash of the wills that can bring out the worst in us and raising children. It can bring out the, the worst anger in us, insecurity, uh, the worst ugly in us. In fact, the most shame that I have in life as an adult is related to my self-centered, where did that come from response to my children? And, and where does the, that response come from? comes from my insecurity, from anger, from fear. And those are all manifestations of self-preservation and reputation preservation. We begin to, to parent our children worried about our own self-preservation or our, or our reputation preservation. And every time we lead and parent in that way, it creates a wedge between us and the very people we're trying to raise. Reputation management. When we get this wrong... Oh man, the wounds are deep. When we get this right, really good things happen. And my parents, uh, great parents, uh, they weren't perfect. No, there are no perfect parents. But one of the times that my parents really got it right, I'll give you an example. This happened in, in college for me. So I went to college at Hendricks College down in Conway, Arkansas. Anybody know Hendricks College down there? Little Methodist school. And uh, so I was there, and I was a part of the Hendricks College Choir. And, 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 and Conway, where Hendricks is, is near Little Rock, not too far, maybe 45 minutes, an hour away. I was in the Hendricks College Choir, which was a really big deal back then. And uh, one of the things that we did is we went on tour every spring and every winter. And the tour was a really huge thing. I mean, it was four or five days with 10 stops all along the way. Uh, and, and sometimes we had a full orchestra that traveled with us. Well, my sophomore year, uh, this was the, the spring break, trip that we were on, uh, one of our stops was in Dallas, because I had a, and, and I had a friend there, uh, and my friend's name is Rodney, and Rodney was a student at SMU, and the deal was, after we were done, if we had friends or family in the place where we stopped, then we could stay with them. So I got in touch with Rodney and said, hey, I'm going to be in town, and, and can I stay with you at your dorm? And so we're both sophomores in college, and so we had a, a wonderful evening together. And then the next morning, he was going to drive me to catch the bus, so that, you know, we all headed out early in the morning to our next stop where we were going to perform. Well, we get up the next morning, and of course, we got up a little later than we should have gotten up. And we go out to Rodney's car to get it started, and his car won't start. It's like, oh, no. 
all right, so what are we going to do, Rodney? He's like, well, I got a friend, and I think uh, she's let me borrow her car in the past, so uh, maybe she'll let me borrow her car now. Well, this is long before cell phones and all that, and, and so Rodney has to get the keys from his friend, and, and the women's dorm was just, you know, totally battened down, locked up, so, but Rodney's like, well, there's a window that we all crawl through to get in, so... He shimmies up this wall and crawls through this window and, and makes his way through the window. I, I stood outside. I did not go in. And so he makes his way to his friend, gets the, wakes her up, gets the keys from her, comes back out, shimmies down the wall. We get her car. We drive out to the place where all the buses are leaving, and they are gone. And I had one of those oh, shoot moments, except, except it was uh, one less vowel and a different vowel in, in that word. And, uh, and here's the deal. I mean, what happened is we had three buses of people. There were two buses for you know, choir and orchestra and stuff. And they did a roll call and somebody said, yeah, I saw Aaron on one of the other buses. And they, they just took off. And so I, we're, we're standing there and Roddy's got a borrowed car, so he can't take me to the next stop where the choir is. So well, let's, let's go to the bus station, see if maybe, maybe we get to catch a Greyhound bus to the next stop. So we go to the bus station, look at the bus schedule. We could get to the next town, which I think was, I don't know, Texarkana or someplace like that. We could get to the next town, but they would have already left for the next stop by the time we got there. So like, what on earth do we do? And I realized at that point, I am not going to catch up with the, the, the entourage. I'm not going to do it. So we figure, well, maybe I should just fly back to Little Rock. This was several days before the tour was going to end. Just go to the airport, catch a flight from Dallas to Little Rock, try and find a ride from Little Rock to Conway. And that's what we did. We show up at the airport and I have $18 of cash in my pocket. <laughs> And luckily, a, get this, a one-way ticket at that, that time from, on Southwest from, from Dallas into, into Little Rock was $36. So I, I said, I got $18 in cash. I've got a checkbook. Will you take a check? And they're like, no, we don't take checks. So I just pleaded with the, the ticket agent, will you take a check, please, just for $18? I and mean, what have you got to lose? $18 if the check's bad. And you've got my address. You can hunt me down. So she's like, all right, all right. So $18 in cash, an $18 check. I get an airplane in Dallas. I land in Little Rock. I got to call somebody to come pick me up because I have no car there. I finally find somebody that can come pick me up, take me back to Conway, back to Hendricks. I get in my car, drive home. I'm in Warrensburg by that night. And my choir has no idea where I am the entire rest of spring break. Now, that's its own little issue right there, right? <clears throat> but I was so afraid of what my parents were going to do to me. You know, because my parents were of that generation where, you know, the teachers are always right, not the students. That the law enforcement is always right, not me. That my, the, the neighbors were always right in disciplining my brother and me, not us. So reputation was very, very important to them. And you did not soil or damage your parents' reputation by doing silly things. like. And I knew that it was mostly my fault. You know, me and Rodney, we just could have got up a little earlier and, and none of this would have happened. So I, I, I was just worried. And I tell my parents, because well, I arrived three days early, they're like, what are you doing here? You know, and I'm like, well, here's the story. And here's what my parents did. Instead of being worried about their reputation and worried about their image management, they came to my defense. Um, what my mom started doing, she wrote a letter to the choir director. Of course, I'd love to have a copy of that letter. <clears throat> wrote a letter to the, uh, the dean, wrote a letter to the chair of the department, wrote a letter to the president of the college, uh, just basically saying this should not ever happen to anybody, not just my kid, but to any kid. And what I felt in that moment was my parents stood with me they weren't so concerned about their rep reputation as they were about just me and then the people that led that, that organization getting it right into the future. I mean, that was so em empowering to me. It was, it was a, 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 not just a teachable moment, but a defining moment where I knew they stood with me. They had their ego in check. When, when our reputation's on the line, what we do and how we respond when our ego is on the line leaves a mark for good or it leaves a mark for bad. Back to parenting. As it turns out, the secret of parenting is actually embedded in Jesus' new covenant command that you love one another as I have loved 
you. But Jesus kept his ego in check, always. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote about this. Check this out. This is Philippians 2, 6, and 8. He wrote, wrote about Jesus. Though he, Jesus, was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God. So Jesus, who was in, very, in, the, in the very nature of who he was, God, humbled himself. If he did that, should we not also do that? Clearly, Jesus kept his ego in check, and he had every excuse not to do that. He was God, but his value system. He was God, but his value system was all about others. Sacrificial love. His value system was, I will do anything for you, only if it's for your good, because I love you. Because I love you. Now, when Jesus issued this new command, he wasn't talking specifically to parents, but what the Apostle Paul does in Scripture, and the Apostle Paul, by the way, if you're not familiar with, this is a guy named Paul who uh, hated Christians in the beginning and persecuted the church and then has this experience. And next thing you know, he is like the biggest advocate for Jesus and, and building the church everywhere he goes, all over the area around the Mediterranean. But he writes letters to people and encourages them. And that's a big part of our New Testament are the letters that he wrote. And what he does is he takes this new covenant command of Jesus and fleshes it out gives us handles to be able to hold on to it so we understand it. And the way he did that was to talk about what it looks like to be lived out. Uh, we call these, uh, the, the writing of Paul, we call these the one another's. There are a whole bunch of one another sprinkled out throughout his letters. Things like this, forgive one another, encourage one another, carry one another's burdens, submit to one another. There are probably 20 uh, or more of these one another's in Scripture. And they're all about how we can live out Jesus' covenant command to love one another. But Paul's most famous explanation about this, this love is 1 Corinthians 13. And Corinthians, uh, that's just a, a, a name of, of, of the people of a little church that uh, Paul helped to start in, in a city called Corinth. So he writes this letter, and many of us have it, had, had it writ, uh, read at our weddings because it's all about love is, love is, love is. It goes down this list of what love is and what love is not. Uh, but it isn't about romantic love. It's about Jesus' sacrificial love. And the first three words of this passage are what I want to spend the rest of our time talking about. Because Paul says, you want to get a handle on what this covenant command looks like? Three words. Ready? Love is patient. Love is patient. And all of us go like, oh, why that? <laughs> you know, when it comes to parenting, oh, it's like Paul knew. Of all things, that, I got to be patient? You got to be kidding me. Why did he start right there? Um, here's, here's a good working definition of, of patience. To be patient means to move at someone else's pace. Isn't that, isn't that a good working definition? To, to be patient means to move at someone else's pace. That's what Jesus' brand of love requires of his followers. Patience, love lived out as patience requires us to move at someone else's pace rather than requiring that person to move at our pace. And this is so unnatural, right? Because what is natural to us? Our natural pace is our natural pace, not someone else's. I thought about this this last week. Um, Jacob Stansberry is our director of family ministries, <clears throat> and uh, he and his wife Sarah have a little boy, and I think he's about one. Uh, how, how old is he, Brian? How old is Winston? Is he about one? He's right at one year old, so, and he just learned how to walk. And you know, you remember how that is when you see your kids walking for the first time, how proud you are of them. And, and so Jacob has brought Win into the office, and let me watch him walk and take those first few steps. It's, but here's the thing. I mean, you can see this. Uh, Jacob is a big guy. This little bitty win, if, if they're walking together and Jacob is walking at his pace rather than Wynn's pace, what happens? Distance. So literally physical distance between them. So the way any parent has to practice patience in learning, you know, teaching a kid to walk is you walk with them. Now, what happens physically also happens emotionally and spiritually. If we as parents begin to walk at our pace emotionally, intellectually, um, spiritually, what's going to happen? There's going to be distance in those areas 
in our kids' lives. Um, we separate ourselves from our children when we are not patient with them. And patience, impatience has its own outcome. In fact, the only direct advice to parents that the Apostle Paul gives is to fathers. <laughs> wonder why. He gives some direction to fathers specifically. Here it is. Ready? Fathers, do not exasperate your children. <laughs> That's it. Uh, other translations say, fathers, do not provoke your kids. Fathers, do not stir them up. The way I would kind of twist this a little bit and, 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 and shape this is him saying, fathers, don't insist on winning because that provokes your children. That exasperates them. Fathers, don't insist on outsmarting your children. Fathers and mothers, don't in insist on out-talking your children. Don't insist on winning all the time. An illustration that came to mind for me this morning around this was with my oldest daughter, Zoe. You know, one of the hardest parts for me about being a parent is not knowing when the last something has happened. You know what I'm talking about? I, I, this break, broke my heart, still breaks my heart to think about. I, I missed the last time I held my kids in my arms. You know? I mean, I can still hug them and all that, but that last time you held your child in your arms. I, I don't know when that was. The last time you pretended, you had a whole just big day of pretend. When was that last time? I don't know. I, I missed it because I didn't know it was the last one. And the, one of them that I regret and I remember is, is Zoe and I, my oldest daughter and I, we'd wrestle around, you know, and have fun doing that. And, and, but the last time, I, I, I know the last time we, we wrestled because I had to be the big guy and win. And so I twisted her arm and I twisted a little too much and I hurt her. And she just screamed and cried, and, and that was it. Well, why? It's so stupid. Why? Well, because I had to win, you know? What does that get us? Distance. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Mothers, don't exasperate your children. Be patient. They can't keep up. I feel like I did this pretty well with our, our first daughter, Zoe, and and I tried to do the same with our, our second daughter, Abby. And the problem, the mistake that I look at is that I tried to do them at the same pace. And they're two different kids. And Abby, some things she did faster, way faster. And some things she did slower. And I didn't quite catch those the way I should. But patience. Patience figures out their pace. Love is patient. I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, well, Aaron, that's great that that's in the Bible to be patient. But what, if we don't push our kids, if we, don't, if we don't expect more of our children than they expect of themselves, if we don't ensure that they reach their maximum potential, then they may turn out to, turn out to what? Before you even finish the sentence, turn out to what? Turn out to be not what you, I'll finish it for you, what you want them to be. What you want them to be. And is that really what you want? Is them to become what you want them to be? Wouldn't it be better to discover what they were born to do and what they were born to be and then facilitate that and get behind that? And so I'd say, yes, inspire your kids. Yes, motivate your kids, but push them to the point of exhaustion and frustration. No, never. Don't do it. Compare and shame. No, never. Because parents... When you do that, that's about you, not about them. Let's not kid ourselves. Andy Stanley tells about one of the most influential parenting conversations he ever had. And he had this conversation long before he ever had children of his own. And he says uh, that this, this, this friend of his was sending his uh, new high school graduate off to college. And uh, his, his son's name was Don. And this guy was telling Andy about his son, Don. You know, he, Don didn't know what he wanted to do when he graduated from high school. He didn't know what he wanted to do uh, as he enrolled in college. And so what, Don, Don, uh, what uh, the dad told his son was this. Son, uh, whatever you want to do with your, your life, I'll support you, and I will use my influence to help you in any way I can. But until you know what you want to do, I hope you'll just trust me to the point, trust me to point you in a direction to get you started. And here's the deal. This is what the dad told his son. Here's the deal. The moment you figure out what you want to do, I will absolutely support you in whatever you want to do. But will you at least take my advice and let me point you in a direction? And the son was like, well, that sounds fair. And here's the story of that son. The guy's name is Don. 
uh, his dad said, so you've kind of got a, a, a really good leaning into the business world. I mean, you've been doing lemonade stands since you were a kid. You're, you're kind of a little entrepreneur. Why don't we start you off in, in business in that direction? And that's what they did. But about halfway through his education, the kid's like, well, I love business, but the part of it that I really, really love is law. And so, you know, he finished out that and went to law school, became an attorney. And the dad's like, whatever direction you want to go, as soon as you know what direction you want to go, I'll be behind you. Well, Andy Stanley said, 20 years later, after hearing that story, I did the same thing with my son. Graduates from high school, doesn't really know what he wants to do with his life, and, and, and says, so, so will you trust me enough to get you pointed in, in a direction, and then as soon as you want to do something else, I will stand behind you and help you in whatever that direction is, but will you trust me enough to get you started? And uh, Andy said, what I see in you is you are a numbers kid. You love numbers, so let's get you started in finance. And what ended up happening is that Andy Stanley's son uh, got his degree in finance, got a great job right out of college, is just doing really, really well. But one day, he comes to his dad and says, Dad, um, I got to tell you something. I, I don't want to be in finance anymore. And like, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? He said, well, I've been going to comedy clubs lately. <laughs> and I'm loving it. And I started not only going to comedy clubs, I started, you know, doing open mic night and getting up on stage and doing a five-minute comedy set that turned into a 10-minute, that turned into a 15-minute comedy set. And I'm getting a lot of good feedback. And Dad, I want to be a full-time uh, stand-up comedian. And of course, Andy's like, I paid out-of-state tuition to do that. <laughs> no, no, he didn't do that. He said, you know, I made a deal with you and that whatever you feel that it's time for you to do something, I will stand behind you. That's the deal. And I'm standing behind you now. I think that's what patience, what love looks like. If I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times from my parents. Um, and, and I hope you heard this, but I know some of you didn't. Um, but what I heard um, so many times from my parents is, Aaron, all we expect from you is that you do your best. And I was mediocre, pretty much everything, and at best mediocre. But they just said, Aaron... All we expect from you is for you to do your best. Now, did I do my best? Heck no. Are you kidding me? Am I trying to do my best now? You bet I am. You bet I am. And I think that statement, I think that statement, all we expect from you is, is for you to do your best. I think that is a statement of patience, that love is patient. Love does not exasperate. Love doesn't drive a wedge. Love doesn't allow ego and reputation to dictate the tone of the relationship Love picks up on someone else's natural pace and matches that pace. That's what love looks like. That's New Testament parenting. So I got a couple of questions. These are hard questions, by the way, uh, to kind of ease us out today. And the first question is this. Who feels rushed by you? Who feels unnecessary maybe even unhealthy pressure when you walk into their room or when you walk through the front door? Who are you driving away in your effort to bring out their best? And then here's the second question. I told you these were hard. What would it take? What would it, what would it look like to adjust your pace to their pace? I mean, that's what the Jesus brand of love requires you to do. It requires us to tame our pride requires us to protect our children rather than always trying to protect our reputations. Oh, and then there's this. There's this. Got to remember, if you live long enough, if you live long enough, you are going to slow down. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> if you live long enough, you're going to slow down and you're going to need those around you to adjust their pace to your pace. The people that you love the most and who love you the most, it will require them to adjust to your pace. So I hope we all raise and mentor and model and, and teach our kids this powerful love of Christ lived out as patience. Now, next week, we're going to pick up right there and go even deeper into parenting in the 21st century. And for today, that is the good news. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.